I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. It's a, truly a pleasure. Ed Sharon is the Science Communication Specialist for the National Park Service Northeast Temperate Inventory and Monitoring Program. Uh, he works with 11 parks throughout the Northeast region. Uh, there's focus on monitoring everything from wildlife, forest dynamics, uh, water, and, and birds. And Ed has the task of packaging up all of that data that they're getting from all of these national parks uh, throughout the Northeast region and sharing it with the public in a way that is engaging and inspirational. And he does a phenomenal job with that. He's worn many hats throughout his career. We've also had the pleasure of Ed working as a lead ranger and acting chief of interpretation for the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park in Woodstock, Vermont, as well as a number of other national park sites. So I've known Ed for a while, and I will just say that he is one of the most phenomenal naturalists that I've had the pleasure of working with. And so you're in for a treat tonight with oh the program that he has. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure at all. Ed, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, turn my microphone on, everybody. Is that coming through? Everybody yeah. hear that? Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, probably unworthy introduction, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, try to live up to it somewhat. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to uh, go ahead and dive right in. I just want to say right off the top that um, you know, I'm going to try to save time for questions at the end. Uh, there's a lot of people here, and I'm sure a lot of you have questions, but that said, if you do have a kind of a burning question uh, as we go through, I mean, go ahead and it's, you know, it'll probably be dark, it might not be able to see your hand, so you can just kind of shout out something if you have a question, I'm fine with that. Um, and we can, uh, you know, take questions as we go to it, whatever kind of works for you guys works for me too. Um, and just kind of a uh, informal poll, um, how many people have done some kind of tracking before? I mean, you don't have to, uh, you know, be an expert or anything, but you see some tracks out in the yard and you're kind of curious, uh, just a show of hands. So, uh, yeah, I mean, most of you, I mean, yeah, I mean, might as well, right? We live in a place where there's a lot of snow, um, and especially if you're not, you know, into skiing or snowshoeing or something like that, you know, you might as well get into tracking because uh, this winter, you know, notwithstanding, um, most winters are a really good time to, to go tracking. I mean, even this winter we had some days, but you know, the past few years uh, has been phenomenal for tracking because it started snowing in October and it stopped till uh, April. It seems like uh, the past couple winters a little different this year, but. Uh, that said, of course, you can go tracking any time of year. Just winter just seems to be uh, you know, the best time for that, just because you do have that nice, clean, kind of blank slate of snow up there, and every night critters are moving around, and you have the chance to see who was there and why they were there and learn all, all sorts of things about them, which is uh, you know, really fantastic. And another reason I really enjoy tracking, too, is because it's kind of one of the more low-tech um, hobbies that you can have. Uh, you don't really need to buy any fancy equipment. Um, or anything like that, you know, basically all you need are your senses. Uh, you just, uh, obviously your eyes are very important for tracking because you, you know, see the tracks, you see the sign that's out there, but uh, all your other senses come into play too. You can actually use your sense of touch and, you know, feel uh, the, the um, texture of certain things left behind by animals. Um, you can even put your fingers inside uh, the tracks in the snow and melt away some of the fresh snow and feel how many toes are in there as well. If you have sensitive fingertips and don't get too cold when you stick them in the tracks. Um, your sense of smell comes in very handy as well too. A lot of animals leave behind uh, scent marking and certain animals that we'll talk about uh, leave very distinctive smells behind that you can actually pinpoint the animal. Sometimes you smell it before you even see it. Um, your sense of hearing as well too. Uh, all animals vocalize in some way or another, some you know, more vociferously than others, but uh, every animal makes some sort of sounds. And uh, from the comfort of your own bedroom with the window open at night, you can go tracking sometimes because you can hear the animals outside in your yard. So, you know, I kind of consider tracking covering all those things. It's not just looking at a hole in the snow and kind of figuring out, you know, what the animal was. It's, uh, you know, learning about all the animals that are around you all the time uh, that you know, often we don't even notice. But, uh, you know, once you start to kind of pick up on a few things, you start to notice that, you know, they're there constantly um, and, you know, right in our backyards very often without us even knowing. Um, and I also kind of consider being a tracker is uh, kind of like being a mystery solver too because you know, oftentimes you do come across a scene like you know, the tracks in the top left over there and uh, you're trying to piece together some of the clues that that animal left behind to not only know what animal it was but you know, sometimes you follow those tracks for a while and you come to a spot where obviously some kind of you know, uh, activity took place and you might find a couple of drops of blood in the snow and that kind of thing and then um, 
you know, there was two tracks of animals, and now there's only one track of animal going off, you know, so you can kind of, um, you know, put together the, the pieces there. And, um, that's why I kind of equate uh, this program and this, uh, you know, tracking as uh, being a mystery solver. And, um, you know, you've all seen and heard of uh, the TV show, I'm sure by this point, uh, CSI, um, crime scene investigations, where they use, you know, of course, all sorts of fancy equipment to do what they need to do. But as they're saying, you know, we don't need to do that. But we are doing TSI uh, in ours. So, uh, which is a similar thing, except uh, again, those are all our uh, those are all our critters that uh, left behind all those signs. So we got the, of course, the Northwood sounds there, and uh, now they always have their uh, Miami edition or New York edition. So this is the Tunbridge edition, of course, of uh, TSI. So uh, we can. Uh, dive in right here and ask those animals to please be quiet. Um, so Christina did a great job of uh, introducing kind of the program I work for. I know you guys are here to talk about tracks, not about something as exciting sounding as inventory and monitoring. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the government doesn't come up with the most exciting names for the programs that they have. And inventory and monitoring might be right up in the top of uh, the most dry sounding things that are out there. But it actually is a very interesting program. Um, that was based off of the founding legislation of the National Park Service. You don't have to read this whole thing, but basically the problem is uh, trying to leave things unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations and the park services. Finding out that they're having trouble doing that in some parks because uh, a lot of times they didn't even know what they had in the park. So if you don't know what you have, it's hard to take care of it and make sure it you know, stays unimpaired. Um, and we work with uh, all sorts of different kinds of environments and habitats including you know, working with invasive species, that's a flying squirrel there, there was an inventory done of those. Uh, phonology with uh, the changing of the seasons. Um, this records the first sounds of amphibians and um, birds calling when they start coming in the next few weeks. So, uh, and we do um, work with, it's a, it's a national program. Um, over 270 uh, national parks are part of it. And we're all broken up into these separate networks because each um, network basically works with a group of parks that share similar natural resources. Uh, and uh, out of the 400 odd national parks that there are out there today, about 270 of them are a part of this program because they have significant natural resources. And uh, as Christina said, uh, up here in the Northeast, uh, Marsh Billings Rockefeller is one of those parks that we work with. Uh, of course, just down the street in Woodstock, uh, St. Gaudens as well. But we stretch basically from Acadia up in Maine down to Morristown in New Jersey. <coughs> and uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Appalachian National Scenic Trail is also a national park unit. Um, it's one of the ones that we work with too, so it's kind of stretching from you know Maine all the way down to Georgia. Um, and uh, tracking is actually a part of uh, science now too. It's not only you know an interesting kind of fun hobby to do, but uh, it's getting recognized more and more that it's going to be another tool in the toolbox uh, for scientists to understand uh, kind of what's in their area and the health of those animals and how many <coughs> there are. Uh, a good example is uh, up in northern Maine. Um, they're trying to figure out how many Canada lynx are just off the Appalachian Trail in the most northern part there. Um, and being a very secretive animal, very hard to see and very hard to kind of study. Um, they, like every other animal, of course, leaves behind signs um, when they're up there, uh, walking through the snow, and there's a cat, and you know, signs up behind that they're feeding and those kinds of things. So they actually were able to get some sort of estimate of uh, you know, the, the health and well-being of the lynx up in there. And, um, at that time, they were doing well, so that's good. Um, so tracking is, again, uh, you know, not only just something fun that can be done, but also is uh, you know, being more and more recognized as a, a part of uh, you know, valid scientific um, experiments. Um, and you know, I just mentioned a few reasons to track, and there are many. Um, and you know, again, it's just a great non-invasive way to learn about the animals that we're sharing our national parks and our neighborhoods with. Um, there are many important reasons to have to tranquilize animals and weigh them and, you know, and check their teeth and all sorts of things like that. But uh, with tracking, um, you, know, you don't even have to see the animal to understand at least that it's there and that you know, there's this many and you know, they're eating this, this amount over here kind of thing. So uh, it can, again, just be another part of uh, understanding what, the, the health of the animals. Um, and you might hear me say this, uh, I probably already said it 10 times, or I'll probably say it 10 more times. Um, I find it, it's uh, just, again, just a, a great fun activity to do, especially if you're not into some of those winter sports and uh, you, know, you kind of uh, dread the next snowfall. But now if you get into tracking, you might be looking forward to the next snowfall because again, that kind of wipes the whole slate clean. And you have a fresh chance to go out there and see you know, you know uh, when it had just snowed, and then you go out and see tracks. You know that those tracks were made, you know, just hours beforehand. So you're basically 
following where a, a Fisher Bruce went or a Bobcat or a Coyote or something. It just makes it that, all that more interesting and special. Um, and studying what animals live where helps scientists understand ecosystem health and even track the effects of climate change. Because um, this is, again, you know, just one of those tools in the toolbox that scientists understand. And as climate changes, animals kind of move their um, territories around. You know, this is going to be just another way that scientists are able to kind of follow that. Um, and another reason I really enjoy tracking is uh, it really does open up kind of a whole new world of uh, animal language to you. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when you come across a scene like this in the woods, you can ask yourself many questions, uh, not least of which, of course, is who is here, but you know, kind of going beyond that, and what I find even more interesting is kind of asking the, the follow-up questions of you know, why were these animals here? And, uh, sometimes you can even answer the question what their state of mind was uh, when they were in the area, just by you know, looking at a few holes in the snow, which is uh, you know, pretty amazing to be able to do that. Um, and with this particular scene here, um, what we have here is a male fisher um, going this direction, and a female fisher was going this direction. And as we uh, roll tape here, um, we can see something happened here. Um, so this was taken um, a few years ago in uh, mid-March, um, snowier winter back then, obviously, uh, than this year. Uh, but mid-March is mating season for these animals. Um, and this kind of starts to answer some of these questions. Um, this uh, male fisher, their territories overlap usually with several female territories, and this fisher was kind of you know, going around, making the rounds, checking things out, making sure he was defending his territory, making sure um, nobody else was in that area. Uh, this female was kind of going about her daily business as well. This is I've been tracking her all winter, and she's went by this spot, and every couple of weeks she'd always make kind of the same rounds around this area. But this time something changed, and you can see you know, when she first ran over that male's tracks, who probably went by first, she didn't really notice much about it, but she must have got a whiff or a scent, uh, because every time these animals take a step, they have glands between their toes, and they actually leave scent just by taking a step in the ground, uh, and that scent actually leaves behind information for these other animals to understand, you know, who the animal was and kind of even what their state of uh, health is. So <laughs> when she ran by, she kind of put the brakes on here. Um, these are uh, walking patterns, so she walks up to his tracks here. Um, and these are her two front feet right here. You can almost picture her sticking her nose right there inside that track there, taking a whiff, understanding, all right, well, this is a male. He's uh, three years old. He uh, seems to be in good health. Uh, he's probably here looking for a mate, uh, but I'm all set with that, and she just kind of uh, continues running off. Uh, and this is a very typical fisher pattern. Uh, it's not uh, you know, a panic pattern. It's not, uh, you know, she doesn't turn around and run after him either, the way there. Um, she just kind of went on about her business and you know, kind of understand that she, things were kind of normal in, in the fisher world at that time. So you know, being able to uh, understand that just by, again, seeing these pupils in the snow is uh, you know, pretty fun to be able to do. Um, I don't know if I, did I mention it's fun yet? I don't know, I might, uh, I, 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 might, I might do that more than once, uh, to, to watch out. But, um, so, and I try not to uh, put too many rules on myself or others when uh, going tracking, but the one I try to always make myself uh, stick to the most is uh, to never say never and never say always uh, when you're tracking, because, uh, you know, no matter how long you've been doing it, I mean, I've been doing it 15 years, which, you know, isn't that long, but it's... Uh, it's long enough to kind of sometimes get a little too cocky about what you're seeing out there. And, um, I'm constantly um, kind of uh, you know, surprised at what I'm finding out there. And uh, you know, the animals uh, like humbling you uh, when you think that you've kind of nailed what you've got there. And I'm sure I'm following a bobcat track and I go down and then you know, 10 tracks later, I see that just kind of the way this coyote has stepped on the snow and it definitely was on a bobcat and I'm doing that. And it was just, uh, so it's just something that you always got to keep an open mind understand that animals don't know how to read. What I mean by that is when you read the guidebooks, sometimes they tell you things uh, that the animals uh, don't, they break the rules. Um, you know, oftentimes they read that cats don't leave claw marks in their tracks, which is true most of the time. Um, but they do sometimes, you know, not infrequently, uh, leave uh, claw marks in their tracks, especially conditions like we have right now, that's really icy and they're trying to get a grip, or if they're running or something, they'll have their claws extended. Um, and sometimes, if the conditions are right, dog claws don't show up in their tracks as well. And uh, so, you know, it doesn't, you can't always say that this is always this and always that. Uh, but, you know, you just kind of speak in probabilities more so that most often these things happen, but, but not always. Um, and another thing uh, that, that you know, it's great for tracking, and you know, people especially just getting started, is 
you only have to go as deep as you want uh, with tracking. What I mean by that is, if you're just satisfied with knowing that a squirrel went by your, your front house there, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and that's, that's as far as you need to go. But, um, you know, you can geek out as much as you want uh, with tracking. I mean, you know, if you look in the guidebooks, you'll see that you know, a lot of people measure it down to one sixteenth of an inch, you know, how close that, that track is and keep uh, you know, all these books and everything and, and journals about uh, what they saw, when they saw it, what the temperature was, where, you know, GPS it. I mean, you can really, you know, go as far as you want with that and just kind of make it uh, a huge kind of undertaking. I fall somewhere kind of in the middle there. I'm not kind of, you know, measuring tracks down to the sixteenth of an inch, but I do go a little bit beyond um, Know, wanting to uh, find out just what the animal was. And I think that kind of comes naturally too once you've been doing it for a while. Um, and you can get really deep into it too as well if you want, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, going, uh, playing a kind of a game of uh, categories with yourself. Uh, and of course, uh, scat is the uh, you know, technical term for animal droppings. And um, you can, uh, you know, it's a whole other layer of uh, tracking. And it's, uh, I'm not going to uh, do, get too much into uh, this tonight, uh, but we'll just look at a few of these things just to show you that uh, obviously uh, it's very diverse. It kind of grosses some people out. Uh, so I, I put it all on one slide, just get it all over with uh, for you here. But um, essentially, it's again, I know I talk a lot about kind of being tools in the toolbox, and this is just another one of kind of you know, being a checklist of when you're trying to kind of identify an animal. If you find scat, that just kind of helps you sometimes further understand what it is. Um, oftentimes, fishers, weasels, leave these ropey, twisted, uh, tapered kind of uh, scat. Um, depending on the time of year, moose and deer, you know, this is a woody, this is a winter scat, and this is a summer scat. Both animals leave uh, different scat during the times of year. Um, this is dog scat, which is, uh, you know, if you have a dog, it's, dog scat's probably not all that exciting for you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you see that a lot, but with coyotes, at least it's a little different. Um, this is actually filled with deer hair uh, in here, that's what all that is. And breaking it apart found actually uh, bits of bone in there as well, too. Uh, so that was something that a coyote had scavenged, uh, that deer carcass that had been around for a while. As opposed to this, it's so dark it's hard, you know, hardly even showing up on the screen. But not to get too graphic, but when the um, scat is dark like that, it means that coyote just enjoyed a fresh meal of uh, you know, basically organs uh, and blood and tissue like that. It was a very nutritious meal for them. Um, when they eat that, it comes out as black. Um, and fox, very diverse diets reflected in their scat as well too, often filled with apples and seeds and nuts and berries. Um, and uh, bobcats leave very tubular kind of uh, scat behind. Black bears as well, filled with all sorts of different things, including berries and human garbage sometimes as well. Um, and porcupines often leave uh, their scat in one big pile uh, somewhere by their dens. Uh, there's a cascading out of their dens even as it is here. This is a tree, a hollow tree that was just coming out of there. So. And, um, and we might see a couple more examples of scat along the way here, but that's uh, you know, basically uh, most of what we have there. And um, this is just to uh, kind of show, not to overwhelm you, but to uh, show you that uh, obviously when you have four legs and you have options of uh, how fast you want to move, you have lots of options uh, the way you're going to use those four legs. Uh, between you know, walking and trotting and galloping. and That's the other thing I want to mention too. If you do get into this and you start reading some of the guidebooks, you're going to see uh, a million different terms for you know, what somebody calls a bound, somebody else will call a hop, and somebody else will what calls a trot, they call it a gallop. Um, don't get too worried about the terms. As long as you're understanding what you're seeing, it doesn't matter what they're called. Um, I try to uh, stick with uh, a guy named Mark Elbrock who wrote a book in 2005 called uh, uh, tracks and sign of North American mammals kind of turned into the Bible of tracking. Um, it just covers basically all of North America and uh, just an amazing book. Uh, so, and a lot of people kind of stick with what he says, so I try to just stick with that, just, just to stick to something. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about several of these different kinds of uh, ways to move. Um, and the other thing is that once you kind of understand a few of them, you know, there's several different trots and gallops and walks, but they all share very similar uh, characteristics. And once you start to be able to group them, there's only only kind of three main groups. It's the walking, the trotting, and the galloping, and, and there's a couple of others in there, I guess. But those are the main kind of three ways for locomotion for animals to move. So it really uh, kind of start, you know, once you start grouping them together, it's not quite as daunting as, you know, trying to figure out, you know, all these things happening at once. Um, and it's also helpful to, uh, you know, kind of putting your detective hat back on. Um, 
getting a list of usual suspects, uh, knowing who is out there. Because if you're here, you know, trying to find tracks of uh, antelope, uh, you're probably, you know, not going to do very well. Um, but if you understand uh, all the different uh, kind of weasels that we have uh, around here, and uh, the different dog species and, and um, rodents, um, that's really going to help a lot. And just like uh, with the uh, kind of the ways that animals have to move, uh, also. Uh, there's different groups of animals, different families of animals. The mustelids, which are the uh, weasels, um, the rodents as well, the dog family, the cat family. You know, there's about 20 animals up here, but there's you know, about half as many groups. And if all the rodents share similar characteristics and move in similar ways, all the weasels share similar characteristics and move in similar ways, dogs as well too. So again, once you start kind of breaking it down into different groups, it's not as kind of overwhelming as uh, you know, trying to figure out, oh my God, there's like 25 animals up here, I'm not gonna learn all those. But you know, once you uh, just start kind of learning a few of them, you'll kind of be able to see all those, those things that, that are shared. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, with one of the fun, funnest animals I find uh, to, to track out here in the Northeast, which is uh, the fisher. Um, an animal of boar uh, in the Northeast as well, too. Um, seems to be doing quite well the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, has really um, kind of come into its own and kind of lost some of its shyness of people. Um, it's still, you know, a treat to see one for sure. They're still, you know, quite rare to be able to have the chance to see one. Another informal poll. How many people have actually seen a fisher here? Yeah, so I'm well over half of you have seen one. So, um, and probably all, you know, within the last few years or five years or so, a lot of those things took place, I would imagine. Um, so they're starting to get more used to, uh, you know, kind of sharing woods with, uh, with, with neighbors. Um, incidentally, you'll see so several videos. Um, I have a trail camera um, that I set up in certain areas, and so all these videos are from a uh, trail camera that I've been able to set up in certain parts of uh, Vermont. Um, that was a female fisher. That's the same female fisher, actually, who uh, you saw the tracks of before, um, over there, when she was smelling the male tracks. Um, and fishers are, uh, again, very interesting animals. Uh, largest weasel that we have can be, the male can be about 11 pounds. Female is usually, you know, seven to eight pounds, so it's quite a bit different uh, in size. Um, a little hard to see here, but they have very sharp claws, very sharp teeth, extremely capable predators. They can climb, run up trees very fast. You know, a squirrel is, uh, you know, usually their kind of last defense is to run up a tree, but with a fisher, that's not going to do them any good. Uh, they can run up a tree just as fast as a squirrel can. Um, they have, uh, especially males, have no problem hunting porcupine, which is uh, you know, unusual. Not too many animals actively hunt porcupines, but fishers will do that. Um, and they, uh, again, kind of looking at size difference, these are two um, tranquilized fishers. That is a female uh, and that is a male. So, you know, significant uh, size difference there. Um, and not only that, but uh, when you look at the way they're even built, um, you can maybe see some differences. This is a female skull here. This is a male skull. Um, and just looking at that, uh, anybody notice one of the main differences between the male and the female skull? Yeah, exactly. Teeth, bigger. Anything else? The eyes seem Yep, yeah, eyes seem to be bigger, yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly, the eye sockets seem bigger. Bigger brain. Yeah, there's something, there's something about the top of the skull there. Anybody seeing that on there? Yeah, yeah this, uh, this, and if you want to impress your friends next time, you can talk about the, the sagittal crest of the fisher. <laughs> it's uh, some of those technical terms. Um, and this, the fisher is not the only animal uh, that has a, a sagittal crest like this. Uh, coyotes also have them. Black bears also have them. Um, any guesses as what function that, that carries in an animal? What do you think attaches to that? The spine? Uh, in the back, sure. The spine would come out here uh, at the back, uh, but off the top of the head, um, and they kind of come in, coming down from the top of the head. Yeah, jaw muscles. Uh, the jaw muscles attach right here. So any animal skull that you see that has that means they have very strong jaws. Uh, you know, wolves are known to be able to crunch through bone, um, as well as uh, black bears have incredibly strong jaws. Um, and that means, again, this male fisher has got quite a bit stronger jaws than his uh, female compatriot, and also probably you know, more likely to go after larger animals. Um, they can uh, you know, go after fawns, and uh, you know, probably more likely to go after the porcupines and some other larger prey than the female would because they do have very strong jaws. Uh, no, none of those molars are crunching bones. This is purely for uh, you know, kind of taking down larger prey. And um, looking at their tracks, 
Um, it's also you know, helpful to kind of see how uh, animals are built as well, too, um, you know, kind of understanding what size uh, feet they have. Um, male, the the uh, fishers actually have larger front feet than hind feet, um, and that is kind of a function of you know being able to hunt um, and go after you know prey, and having those big paws to grab on things and be able to um, take down prey. Uh, all weasels have five toes on the front foot and hind foot, and again, this is one of those kind of things where you can really kind of get into the nitty gritty, and you know it is helpful to remember how many toes there are on the animals. Not you know, totally unnecessary, but it is helpful sometimes when you're tracking, um, and you know. You guys have all seen tracks before, and, and I've been tracking for a while, and I've never come across fisher tracks that perfect. That's not my picture. Uh, so it, it just doesn't happen very often. Um, sometimes they come across ones that are, that are you know, quite pristine and clear, but um, you know, it's very rare to come across a perfect track, which is what you often find in guidebooks, which can be frustrating at times. But um, it's still helpful, however, to study um, the pristine track. And uh, you know, the internet's great now to find pictures of fisher feet. Because um, then when you come across tracks that aren't as pristine, but you still kind of see a good, uh, you know, heel um, and uh, pads impressions and maybe, you know, some of the toes and you see the pattern there that kind of sticks out in your mind. It kind of looks like it did in, in that Fisher, perfect Fisher track that I saw. So it's still helpful to understand what a perfect track looks like, but even though you're, you know, rarely come across that outside, but it does, uh, you know, it's good, still helpful to know. Um, What's more helpful is to study uh, track patterns, trail patterns, because um, again, you can see these are still nice tracks, but they're not quite as pristine as that. And then more often you're going to come across these trails than you are, of course, you know, the perfect tracks that you have here. And understanding the ways that uh, fishers like to move, and these are the two primary ways uh, that fishers travel. Um, the 2x2 two two lope and the 3x4 lope. Um, and you know, very kind of self-descriptive titles there, two by two, you know, obviously because you have two holes here, two here, two here. Uh, the three by four, that is because oftentimes you have all four feet showing, and sometimes they bunch up a little bit, so it looks like they maybe should be three uh, together. And what's happening here, um, this is a very efficient way for fishers to travel and all other animals too. You can see the snow is a little bit deeper here than it is here. Um, and you know when you're all about efficiency when you're a wild animal, of course, because you, know, you never know when that next meal is coming and um, you want to save as much energy as possible, especially for an animal that's as active as a fisher, that you know, is an active hunter, it's running through its territories trying to hopefully scare up a, a rabbit or a squirrel or um, you know, a porcupine or whatever that's out there and kind of chase it down. Um, so they want to be you know, kind of saving as much energy as possible. And it makes sense uh, you know, if you have four legs uh, well, you know, we've all been snowshoeing or walking out in deep snow uh, with somebody and, of course, you know, if you're the person in front, you say, all right, well, I've done my part, now we'll switch and you, know, you can be the person in front and I'll fall on your tracks. Um, if you have four legs, uh, it makes total sense. You know, why would you make uh, four holes in the snow with all four legs? You're using twice as much energy as you need to. Your front two feet just made these two perfectly good holes in the snow. Why not use your, your hind feet to land right in that exact same two holes and you're going to use you know, half as much energy uh, as you would otherwise. So it's a little hard to visualize um, that that's what's happening here, but the two front feet landed here, the animal pushed off, and its hind feet landed in the exact same spot, essentially, as the, as the front feet just were. Um, something a little different happened here. Uh, the snow is not quite as deep. It might be moving a little bit more of its, one of its kind of more natural uh, locomotions here. Um, but, but while you might think these are the hind feet and these are the front feet because that's the way you know, animals are built, uh, when they're moving, when they're running or loping, uh, that's not the way their feet fall, however. Um, remembering they have larger front feet than hind feet, you can see these are actually the two front feet here, and these are the two hind feet right here on the top. Uh, so two front feet, two hind feet. So how does that happen? Again, it kind of goes against our, uh, you know, our, the way our, our minds work. Uh, it doesn't seem like that, that would be possible. But um, again, luckily, um, we have the internet that comes to the rescue often with this with lots of different videos of animals. Um, and of course, you know, I always say that, but with this particular video, you, you can't find it on the internet because this is one that my friend took. Uh, so you have to know my friend uh, to get this one. But um, I'm sure there are uh, other uh, videos that are out there um, of animals. But, this is a fisher, um, as you'll see. I'm um, actually running behind his house uh, a few years ago. Um, I kind of got st stuck on this island that's behind his house right by this river. They can swim, it's not their favorite thing to do, um, but they can, um, and this one just decided it didn't want to. Um, and it kept them running around the same spot for about an hour or so until it finally gave up and swam across. Um, but this is a, 
The animal moving, it's very hard to see what happened there, but uh, with the power of uh, being able to rewind, it comes in very handy here. And uh, we're going to um, stop right about, yeah, let's go one more ahead here. So now, um, and I'll move this aside, maybe so we can oops, see the um, see the tracks there, maybe. Yeah, so what's happening here, the front two feet are down, you can see. Um, and that would be you know, how these tracks would be left like that. You can see that the rear end is actually up in the air. And uh, one of the rules of thumb of tracking is that um, the farther the hind feet land in front of the front feet, the faster the animal was moving um, because it has more momentum. So you know, the, what we're seeing in the middle here is a slightly slower um, gait, uh, G-A-I-T, um, than this one is here. It's a little bit faster. So as this animal kind of gains speed, we're actually going to see it go from a 2x2 two two to the 3x4. Um, so we'll see it actually, as its front feet kind of vacate that spot there, um, the hind feet are going to land in that exact same spot. So as that front foot, front right foot leaves, feel that rear foot lines almost exactly right where that was. Um, and then as it kind of make that corner, and now it's starting to gain some speed here, uh, and we'll stop it here. So now we can clearly see the front two feet are down. We'll continue to watch that right front leg. And as it moves forward, you can see that that hind foot clearly lands in front of where that front foot just left. So, uh, and that's exactly how that you know, track uh, on the right was made. And then that's why I really like watching videos like this and kind of studying them in slow motion and seeing that happen. Because now, when I come across a scene in the woods, I actually have that video playing on my mind. I can actually see that fish you know, running through the woods. Uh, just like it was just again just like an hour or two or you know, a few days beforehand or something so um, it's just you know kind of little theater in your mind that you can watch the animals right in front of you and you remember and understand how that they move so and that's another reason to you know, be able to study tracks and watch uh, some videos of uh, animals moving around <coughs> all right so that um, is uh, you know, somewhat of the fisher uh, we didn't cover everything that they do obviously but um, I we want to move on to another animal um, that is very common around here. You, know, you probably see these tracks more often than you would uh, the fisher tracks just because uh, red fox are very comfortable with people. Um, they love edge habitat. We make a lot of edge habitat kind of where the field meets the forest. Uh, you know, that's a lot of where our houses are built, obviously. So uh, they do uh, very well uh, with humans. And they are also uh, very capable predators, uh, animals. Perhaps the most surprising thing about fox, however, is their size. Uh, they're, they're relatively tiny. Um, a big red fox is 15 pounds. Uh, most of them are quite a bit smaller than that. So, um, you know, anybody remember how much a, a male fisher could weigh? 11. Yeah, 11 pounds. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a big male fisher can be bigger than a, you know a, a small red fox. Um, and you know, that, that's not uncommon. They're mostly, you know, especially in the winter, they're just a, a puffball. You know, they've got a lot of fur, their tails are very puffed out. Um, I should have a picture up here of one in the summer, too, because they're much more svelte looking. Uh, you know, they have uh, a lot less of those winter uh, guard hairs and, and fur coat on. You can see, and this one has a meal of a, a gray squirrel, and that's a pretty sizable meal um, for that animal. You know, it's a mouthful, for sure. Um, and they, um, this is uh, looking also at kind of the relative size difference between them and uh, their larger cousins. We don't have uh, you know, gray wolf here, obviously, but just you know, just looking at the size of the tracks, you can tell that there's you know, a massive difference between those two. Um, and I mentioned you can track with your ears too. And red fox are a great animal to track with their ears because they are um, pretty vociferous, um, especially um, during mating season, which was uh, January into February. Uh, it's kind of passed on by this point. Um, but they do, uh, they have a surprising repertoire. Um, they can um, bark, they can yelp, they can growl, um, they can yodel almost. Uh, they have uh, all sorts of amazing different sounds that they can make. And they're often doing it, uh, you know, most times the animals are, are vocalizing, they're beginning to communicate with a member of their own species, uh, usually the opposite you know, member of the, of the sex of the species, or you know, if, uh, you know, territorial disputes, those kinds of things. Um, and oftentimes it's at night too, which uh, you know, if you're in a tent at two o'clock in the morning uh, by yourself and you hear these sounds up there, your imagination kind of runs wild and you can you know, hear all sorts of things. Um, this is, uh, we're gonna listen to one sound that uh, red fox can make, which Sometimes uh, results in uh, police stations getting phone calls because uh, uh, they, they get somebody yelling for help in their backyard. So let's uh, listen to that.
So, I mean, you know, that could be kind of creepy if you're by yourself at 2 o'clock in the morning. I can see how that would be, uh, you know, cause for alarm, but um, that was a red fox. Um, incidentally, we just saw the fisher there, and the fisher, again, I said is kind of a creature of lore. Uh, one of the kind of the legends that won't die is uh, kind of the screaming fisher. Um, and you know, scientists have been studying fisher for a long time now, and they haven't been able to document a single fisher doing that. Um, they just, uh, it's highly much more likely that it's red fox uh, that are making those sounds. Again, red fox can make a wide range of sounds um, and are much more apt to be making calls. Um, so it's uh, you know, probably uh, more likely to be uh, the red fox that are making those kinds of sounds. Um, they have found that fishers do make kind of sounds, but usually the ones they've had in captivity anyway um, are just very low key sounds just with each other and nearby proximity. Um, just kind of communicating back and forth with little kind of growls and, and things like that, but nothing like very loud. I've never heard any broadcasting its uh, you know its, its position anywhere. Um, looking at uh, red fox tracks and feet, um, they are an interesting animal because um, they actually uh, kind of grow mittens on their feet during the winter. Um, they completely cover their feet, all their toe pads and heel pads, uh, with fur. Um, not all animals do that, uh, but it's uh, you know a great way, to, obviously, to keep their feet warm. But also, uh, as you imagine, you know, just like if you put your hand in the snow with a mitten on, um, it's not going to leave as clear of a track if you uh, put your hand in the snow without anything on it. So that kind of leaves more muffled tracks, which is a, as one of those clues um, that you know should help you when you're trying to identify animals, remembering that they have very furry feet. Uh, unlike you know, coyotes, definitely still do have fur on the bottom of their feet. Uh, gray fox somewhat too as well, but the red fox has extremely furry feet, um, and that's something that can be a clue for you. And this is uh, you can see you know, somewhat of impressions of heel pads and toe pads in here, but it's not you know, super crisp. Um, and they start to lose some of that fur uh, you know, towards uh, spring, uh, you know, sort of this time of year, so some of that's going to come off. Um, and you know, it doesn't all come off, uh, but it does uh, get quite a bit more of uh, being able to see uh, toe pads in there. And something else that you might notice in here, um, even under all that fur, is kind of that uh, boomerang or um, chevron shape there. Um, and sometimes that shows up in the tracks, um, even with uh, you know, all that fur on there. And this is one of those, uh, you know, I, I started out by saying never say never, never say always, but it's always a red fox when you, when you see that. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> Um, if you see it consistently, because then, you know, it could step on a stick a weird way or something and leave like a little you know, impression in it that looks like that. But if you consistently see that on tracks, then you can you know, pretty, feel pretty good that it's a red fox if it's doing you know, other red fox type things as well, especially. Um, and looking at uh, some of their other uh, characteristics, um, remembering how, again, kind of realizing how animals are built is helpful to uh, understand what you're seeing. So with uh, the red fox, for example, do you think it's supporting more weights on its front two feet or its hind two feet? Front, yeah, why do you say that? Yeah, exactly, it's got its head, it's got its neck, it's got its brain, everything in there in the back is basically just a really fluffy tail. So do you think it has bigger front feet or bigger hind feet? Bigger front feet, exactly, yep, uh, supporting more weight there. So there's actually two sets of tracks here. Um, the hind feet are very faint though, because again, they don't, show up as much because uh, they're not sort of holding as much weight. So this is obviously the front track here, but if you look closely, here's the hind track. And the two front toes are right there, here's a side toe there, another one there, a little bit of a heel pad there, but it's very faint. Um, so it's something uh, you've got to keep an eye out for and you can kind of, you know, and it helps you kind of diagnose what it is. Uh, but it's not great here, but in this one you can actually see the fur on their feet too. And the, and the mud, it shows that usually mud are great for showing the fur inside the, the um, tracks of animals. Um, and this was uh, just something that was in the way that I moved. Um, so it looks like, I don't know, looks like the animal did something without just me getting that out of the way and making it look like something happened there, but it was just a photographer that was doing something. Um, and looking at the way they move as well too, and kind of uh, some of their favorite uh, gates, their locomotive uh, practices. This is a very, very common red fox uh, trail pattern um, in the business known as a direct register. So, uh, similar with what we saw with that fissure, each hole in the snow here represents where two feet landed. So again, a front foot came out of here, the hind foot landed in it, same with all these. Uh, there's a front and a hind foot in each one of those, which can be hard, again, to visualize, but uh, this is a video you can find on the internet. Uh, well, at least uh, five years ago, you could find it on the internet. I don't know if it's uh, still on there, but I imagine it still is. Um, this is uh, and this is a very common way for red fox to move. 
Now, not even in just snow, because you can see this is not snow, it's just a dirt road there. Um, this is just a uh, common way for them to move uh, all the time. Um, and this is a very young, small red fox we're going to watch uh, move in this way. And again, uh, this one's a little bit of a faster gait, so a little harder um, you know, on your eyes to see that. You can see it somewhat. Very much of a bouncy track. If you own a cat at home, cats often move this way too. Um, it's just a very um, common way for uh, a lot of animals to move. It's a very efficient way to, to move. That bounce is actually kind of their tendons and you know, bouncing down and coming back up and they kind of reuse that energy as they're going. So like kind of that very bouncy um, trail pattern or that very, um, very bouncy pattern of them moving is a, a kind of diagnostic that you can see with your own eyes. And that's really moving slowly. So I'm gonna speed it up a little bit there and back them up. Um, we'll, we'll watch it in uh, slow motion here. The other thing that you can see with their naked eyes as well too is that it almost looks like their, you know, their right front leg and their rear left leg are connected by cables. They move in exact synchronicity uh, on either side of the body as you can see there. And also you're gonna see there that that left front leg, as soon as that leaves that spot there, uh, that rear leg lands just about almost exactly where that was. Uh, so that, as it continues to go, it's kind of that very bouncy um, gait as it's moving uh, across the way here. So that's exactly how these uh, tracks were made uh, that we see right there. So you can, you know, you can picture, uh, picture that fox uh, moving just that way through there. Um, another very common way for them to move um, is a, uh, a gallop. Um, and this is, uh, just like we saw with that fisher, these are the front two feet here, and these are the front, and these are the hind feet here. So uh, and remember that rule of thumb: the further the hind feet land in front of the front feet, the faster the animal is going. So this is a, you know, quite a bit of a faster um, gait than we saw on the other one. Now those front two feet land down, uh, the rear ends up in the air. So here we have here, uh, those front two feet down, the rear end flies through the air and lands in front of the front two feet. Um, and that great red fox is so um, agreeable, it's actually going to move in this uh, gate going back. So it's going to show us uh, both of uh, the different ways to move. Um, it's, gonna, it's actually sitting by a road here, and it's not uh, too keen on being looked at by this person. So it's going to decide it's, uh, it gets a couple of scratches and decides that it's uh, kind of move on. This is obviously a young, a young red fox here. But, uh, and, and there it goes. This is faster. Again, it's going to be harder to see um, with your naked eye. Um, but believe it or not, it was moving that way. But now again, we can rewind and uh, see very clearly here. Um, front two feet are down. Those are the front two feet, just like that. Rear ends up in the air. And as it moves, it's going to go right by the camera. It's going to be easier to see those hind feet landing in front. But front two feet down and the rear feet going ahead. And you can even count the footfalls. So the right front, right, uh, yeah, right front, left front, right rear, left rear, right left, right left. And that one you can very clearly see you know, that front left leg there and the rear feet landing quite a bit in front of where those just were. So you now kind of again getting into the nitty gritty a little bit there. Um, this is called the, the transverse gallop. Um, and that means that the order of the footfall is across the body. As I said, it was right, left, right, left. Um, and this is, a, this is called a rotary gallop because of uh, the way the feet land. So this is now um, right, left, left, right. Um, it's also called um, the C gallop, which is a little bit more easy to remember because it kind of leaves the shape of a C in the snow. Um, and just uh, for whatever reason, this is kind of the fastest that an animal with four legs moves usually. Um, if you have a dog at home and you let your dog outside to run around, uh, nine times out of ten it's running in this rotary C gallop. Um, it's high energy, high intensity, it's uh, going everywhere, checking everything out, uh, having a blast. Um, but it uses a little bit more energy to be able to get that momentum for that foot to go forward there. Um, and we can actually uh, watch it just very briefly, a red fox doing that. And this, not like, this is a fantastic website called the archive.org. It's um, you know, got millions of different uh, photos and videos of animals. Uh, this is another uh, summertime red fox. And uh, you'll be able to see here an animal um, doing this. And this is something you can actually see with your naked eye somewhat too because 
very interestingly, uh, at least I find it to be interesting, um, that uh, this animal has uh, two different um, times that it's um, completely off the ground. It's completely suspended off the ground, like this one. It's called uh, extended suspension because it's kind of flying like Superman there. All the you know, four legs are splayed out. And then as it goes forward and pushes off, um, it's all off the ground again. Uh, um, and this is called gathered suspension because all four legs are together. And you can actually see that with your naked eye when, you know, when you watch your dog run around. Too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, you see, if you see your dog doing that, there you go. Exactly, yeah. And if you see your dog doing that, um, you know that it's doing this, uh, this gallop here. Um, and as we watch its footfalls land, uh, watch the right, so that's the right front, left front, and left rear, right rear. So again, right, left, left, right. Um, and that's just a fast, um, for every reason, they get a little bit more of a momentum, a little more of a push off. And you'll see the reason why this red fox is uh, running as fast as it can is because uh, it found another red fox that uh, has something that it wants. Um, so it's going to use uh, that uh, you know, super fast uh, gallop. They don't do this run very often, but again, when they're doing it, uh, you have an idea of state of mind. It's something that they're very at work uh, and pulling the, pulling the other one out of it. It's a nice little mule there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and red fox, <laughs> again, as I was saying, they are very capable predators. Um, you can see here why. Um, they have the full set of everything an animal might need to you know, do well, and red fox tend to do very well around here. Um, very sharp canines, of course, uh, called canines for you know, the dog family. Um, they have these uh, what are called carnassial teeth that help grind, uh, you know, kind of shear meat off the bone. Um, they have uh, molars as well, too, that allows them to crunch the, the, the apples and the berries and nuts and other things, too. So they have a very varied diet. Now, of course, you see these huge ears here, very sensitive hearing. Any animal with a long nose generally has a very uh, sensitive sense of smell, too. Um, now, a lot of animals, uh, dogs, uh, wolves, coyotes, have about a thousand times more sensitive smell than we do. Which, you know, I don't even know how to quantify that. Uh, just uh, an amazing stat right there. I mean, it's obviously a whole different world open to them than what we know about. Um, but we're going to watch a red fox um, use kind of all of these tools that it has here. Um, hunting, uh, what the narrator is going to call a field mice. It's the same thing as meadow voles. But this is a red fox that's um, hunting uh, for meadow voles in, in uh, three feet of snow. So we're going to watch how they do that. Deep snow covers the Black Hills of the Dakotas. Hidden under that icy blanket, field mice are stirring. <laughs> the odds of catching anything might seem hopeless, but not to him. <laughs> Of the time. 
So that's uh, pretty amazing. That's kind of new to science as well, too, the whole facing north thing and using the magnetic field. They've only you know, kind of figured that out the past uh, five, ten years or so. Um, so just, uh, you know, a lot of people knew that birds sometimes just help migrate, but it's kind of new and understanding that all their other animals use that, too. Um, so at this point, I think, uh, you know, I've kind of been talking a long time here and my, my own uh, things, but uh, I'll kind of open it up to suggestions. Anybody have a um, particular animal they want to see on here that we can take a look at? Black bear. Black bear, sure. They're fun as well, too. Um, another animal that's doing extremely well in Vermont and the Northeast. Um, in the past uh, 15 years or so, they've greatly expanded uh, their population here. Um, and these are all um, natural colorations of, of uh, black bear. In the Northeast, they tend to be you know, aptly black. Um, but uh, when you go further down in the Smokies, uh, down in the Tennessee area, they're often cinnamon colored. This is not an albino, it's actually a white black bear, extremely rare. Um, this one's actually in captivity in the Cincinnati Zoo, um, and they, every you know, one or two percent of them, or less than one percent I think actually, is turns out to be a white black bear, um, but it's uh, you know, very uncommon obviously, um, but that is, uh, does occasionally happen. Um, and they are obviously large, you know, it can be almost 600 pounds uh, at their largest. Um, you know, usually they're uh, wow. 300 something pounds around here, not quite that large for the males, but uh, nonetheless a formidable uh, animal. <laughs> and uh, they have, uh, you know, as you might imagine, aptly large feet uh, to be able to do that. Um, and they tend to have larger hind feet. If you think about kind of the way they're built, they kind of have a wider you know, rear end, it looks like, uh, when they're moving around. So their hind feet are actually larger than their front feet. Um, and this is uh, the front foot here. Front foot has this very distinctive circular pad here. It doesn't always show up in the tracks, but when it does, um, you know, again, it's a good uh, indication. Not too many other animals leave size of tracks around here that black bears do, so usually when you come across their tracks, you're, you're pretty certain that it is a black bear, but you know, some of the younger cubs or some things you know, would obviously have smaller feet. Um, hind feet, uh, again, are larger, almost like human-like as well, too. Um, sometimes you see their tracks up there too, but obviously you know, you're seeing uh, claws that show up quite often in their tracks too, long, sharp claws, mostly just for digging and for climbing trees as well. Um, they very you know, easily can climb trees. Um, and this is a typical uh, kind of pattern of the black bear with the larger front foot here, overstepping the smaller front foot here. Um, and we can um, see, you know, most times though, they're so big, they're not you know, running around a lot like the smaller animals using up light energy. They're walking most times. It's kind of their natural pattern here. So when often when you come across their tracks, um, you see, you know, this is another overstep, a front foot and a hind foot, you know, overstep to the, the front foot there. Um, so that is a faster walk because the hind foot landed in front of the front foot. Sometimes it's the opposite. You can know it's a, it's a, it's a uh, not quite as a, in this case, for example, here's a front foot and a hind foot here. So the hind foot did not overstep the front foot, so this is a slow walk. So they can walk fast and walk slow. Um, we'll watch briefly how that happens. I think you can even watch this in um, regular speed because they do uh, walk slow enough. Um, this is uh, conveniently called bear walking. So uh, and you can just see that front foot, that, this is an overstep walk. You can see that that hind foot is overstepping where that front foot just was. So, now it's not super fast, um, but when they want to go down even slower, you know, they actually have to put their hind foot down before it you know, crashes into the back of their front foot, which you know, makes the pattern on the other side here where the hind foot is before. So very common, um, you know, when you, once you see, you know, when you see a bear in a natural state, usually it's walking, if you're lucky enough to see it out in the woods, usually they're running away from you. Um, so they can run, obviously, but you know, most times they just like to be able to uh, walk through their territories for the most part. <clears throat> they leave behind all sorts of other signs as well too, um, especially here in the Northeast where we have uh, beech trees. Um, you know, of course, with the, no more chestnuts uh, around, the beech nuts are kind of some of their primary forms of uh, being able to eat to fatten up for uh, this time of year, for winter. Uh, and when they're such large animals, of course, when they climb up a tree, um, they leave signs behind. And this is actually, if you look closely, these are actually climb marks of a bear that probably climbed that tree 10 years ago or something like that. Um, it just stays on there because of that, that bark. So yeah, it's zoomed in right there. And you can see uh, how that happened. This is uh, you know, with one of these front paws because they hold on to the sides and their front paws and then they walk up um, the tree um, that way. Uh, for time purposes, we won't watch that. It's very brief. This was uh, just uh, 
behind my house um, this last year. A very fresh uh, claw marks and the black bear coming up that. Um, I went up to this tree because when I was coming up to it, I looked up and I saw this up in the top. Uh, and that was a good clue that a black bear was up there. Um, a lot of people mistake those for squirrel's nests uh, when they see them. Um, but uh, sometimes it is. Um, but oftentimes, uh, and if you look closely, um, this was actually what happened was a black bear climbed up here in the fall when there were beech nuts up there and when the leaves were still on the tree. Um, being 400 pounds, it didn't want to crawl out to the end of the limb there and grab the branches. And when you're that big, you can just grab the limbs and pull them to you. So basically, it sat in the crotch of this tree here, pulled all the branches in, um, got the, the nuts off of them. And since the leaves were still attached to the tree, when the bear broke those branches, you know, the tree wasn't able to communicate with those leaves and tell them to drop the leaves anymore and never got the message from the, you know, the abscission layer to kind of let go of that leaf. So the leaf stays on there year round uh, for, the, you know, for that winter. Yeah. Um, when you see that, you, you know, if you look up and you see a whole bunch of broken branches and leaves still on the tree, go up to that tree and take a look at uh, that beech tree. And, you know, you're probably going to find that, that it's been climbed up by a black bear. Um, and there's 15, 20 trees uh, in the back of uh, this area here where black bears had uh, climbed up and you know, got their, their nuts up there. Um, other signs you sometimes find, um, this is uh, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire here. If you can see here, this is actually a white pine post uh, for a ski trail, um, and it's been uh, mauled basically by a black bear. Um, and when they do that, um, you know, they are leaving signs behind for other black bears. You know, usually males and females don't even know whose territory this is and how strong they are. Here is that sagittal crest on the black bear. So again, they have very strong jaws. <coughs> and they bite these, they claw them, uh, they'll bite tree. If there's no, and this is just um, a beautiful sight for a black bear to come across. A smooth, clean, you know, white pine post like this. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to beat the crap out of this thing. Um, if they don't have that, then they have to do it on a tree, which you know, probably isn't quite as exciting for them to be able to do it. Because um, they know that these posts leave behind you know, great um, sign. You see a close-up of it. And not only do they bite it um, and scratch it, but they'll also turn their backs on it, rub up and down. And often when you look closely, uh, as we zoom in here, you often find their hairs uh, stuck in there still too. Um, that's, uh, you know, those hairs, they do that too because the hairs will leave scent behind as well for other animals, uh, for other bears to be able to smell and again understand how, you know, how high, the, they usually reach as high as they can and bite as high as they can and um, shows how tall and big and strong they are. So it's uh, again, another way for them to communicate to um, you know, bears about you know, what else is going on there. Um, it's probably time for you know, one more or maybe, maybe you know, a couple more, but at least one more. Go ahead. The Canada Lynx? Sure, yeah. Um, so I have, uh, okay, have, yeah, Canada Lynx here. So Canada Lynx, uh, they, they are kind of, a, a, I wouldn't call them the, a usual suspect uh, for this part of Vermont in any way, but they are definitely in Vermont. Um, as recently as last winter, I think they proved um, that they're mating up in, um, so not remember, does anybody remember the name of the wildlife refuge up in the Northeast Kingdom up there where they, um, what was it? Silvio Um Was it that one? Um, might have been that one, but uh, yeah, there is, that is definitely up there. But there's not, that's not ringing a bell. I mean, that's that one. But there is, there's definitely there's a wildlife refuge up there um, where they uh, were able to find uh, signs of uh, actually you know, uh, lynx kittens uh, up there. So they know that for sure that they are they're breeding up there. Um, and lynx uh, are uh, you know, again a very specialized, uh, amazing animal. Um, roughly the size of a bobcat, maybe a little smaller actually than a bobcat. They just have much larger, lo longer legs and much larger feet uh, than bobcats do. Um, and if you're, you know, trying to, if you see one of these animals, a lot of times again you're going to be seeing it move away from you. And what you can tell it's a lynx if its tail, the entire tip is black. On a bobcat, only the top of the tail is black. Uh, just the tip of the tail. So if you're seeing it walk behind you, you know, away from you, and you see the full tip of uh, that being black, you know it's a lynx. Um, and again, enormous feet, obviously adapted for walking on deep snow, and that's where they're you know, most at home going after, uh, especially uh, snowshoe hare. And um, it's, uh, they have, you know, the toe pads are pretty spread far apart, um, so that shows uh, here that they're you know, just big tracks, but a lot of space in between all of the toe pads and heel pads, just because they are very furry and <coughs> spread pretty far apart. Um, and their natural rhythm, just like a bobcat, just like uh, your house cat at home, uh, walkers for the most part. Um, cat strategy for hunting is kind of the opposite of it is for uh, you know, fishers and other animals. They're not actively going out and trying to chase something down. They're like, you know what, 
Uh, I'm going to kind of take it easy here a little bit. I know that uh, snowshoe hair are active over in this area, so I'm going to go over, sit on top of the hill here, and just wait um, and see what happens. I'll lay down in the sunshine, you know, I'll wait to see if a, a, a hair comes by, and if it does, then they'll kind of go in and stop and go after them, but they're not, you know, usually running around trying to scare up prey. They're waiting for the prey to come to them because they, they know where those hot spots are where they're active. So, you know, they're, much of what you see is them walking, and they're direct register walkers. These are uh, in the front, and uh, um, the behind track landing right on top of it. Um, and just big tracks too, as well, because of you know, those, those big, large hind feet there. Um, so this is kind of see, you know, this is that direct registered trot. You can almost see the bounciness of the, that red fox that we saw in that hind foot is about basically about to land right where that front foot just came out. Um, what is the weight? The weight of a lynx? Um, they, they, that will be huge lengths. Um, yeah, they're more likely uh, in the 20 pounds of you know, big males and 30 pounds, but most of them, you know, high teens for a female and males in the mid to high 20s probably. Um, they can be more than that. Uh, the record uh, bobcat for New Hampshire was 52 pounds. Um, and so but that's extremely rare. Again, they're uh, usually in, in the 30s for, for a male and 20s for a female, but they can be you know, enormous uh, occasionally. Um, so it is uh, just past eight. I mean, I'm happy to do one more, or I don't know, it depends on what you guys want to do, but uh, it's kind of up to you. Yeah, go ahead. The moose? Sure. Yep, uh, so I think I have these guys uh, grouped together. That is obviously not a moose. This is a, <laughs> this is a test. Um, that's a uh, white tailed deer, but I grouped the moose and the deer together because um, they're, you know, very similar and in very different ways. Um, this is, uh, you know, even the way the mother's taking care of the calves on there are you know, pretty similar. Um, but the biggest difference, of course, being you know, moose are enormous um, and, and deer are quite a bit small. You know, 200 pounds sounds big until you realize, you know, male moose can be over you know, 1,400 pounds. Um, so um, there's uh, you know, quite a bit of a size difference in there. Um, and uh, moose uh, are definitely in our area, especially you know the higher you go up here, you know, the higher parts of Barnard, um, they're, they're, you can you know, not too uncommon up there. And anywhere really where there's a lot of spruce fir, um, it's kind of their preferred habitat. But uh, you'll see them moving through um, in the spring when the mother and the calf are often moving through to new territories, and you know the most time that you're seeing them is uh, in the early spring, you know May time is uh, when a lot of them are sighted and hit by cars, unfortunately. Um, and they are an animal, of course, that can make uh, lots of different sounds. Um, this is a, uh, an aggressive male moose here, which, um, you know, obviously uh, never want to approach wildlife, but especially when it's making those kinds of sounds. Given uh, <laughs> it's wide berth, uh, it's, it's probably a good idea. Um, and this is the sound of uh, you know, deer have, a, a, again, a kind of a surprising uh, range of sounds, too. Uh, most times when they're making sounds, again, it's communicating with either their calf or uh, the herd. You know, they huff a lot. They can make these clicks and pops. Um, this is uh, kind of on the lines of the clicks and pops um, sound here. So let's take a listen to that. So, no idea what that means, uh, but uh, that was uh, them talking to each other, basically. So something very important to say, sounded like. But. Um, and looking at moose deer tracks, you know, obviously the biggest difference being the size of the tracks, but they're, they're fairly similar. They both have dew claws. Um, is there deer feet here? With the, the front dew claws are a little closer to the, um, the, the front uh, two cloven hoof here, and the dew claws are a little further back. Uh, with the moose, the dew claws are pretty close on both uh, the front and hind foot, so they more often show up in the tracks. Um, they don't always show up in uh, the, the deer tracks, but they do sometimes, uh, depending on conditions especially. Um, and moose are just designed for deep snow, um, just the way that they're built. Um, and you know, deer obviously don't do as well when the snow is as deep. Um, they have to kind of snow plow through an area, and they're often kind of stuck in um, these planned routes that they have to go through, which makes them easier for coyotes and uh, other animals to pick them off uh, when that happens. But you know, this winter, was, except for the ice, was, was pretty easy for them. Um, this will just uh, watch uh, you know, the moose doing their thing. This is uh, going through, oh, yeah, this is through somebody's window. This is off the internet, so this is through somebody's back window here apparently. But you can see that they have kind of reverse knees, 
Um, so even though it's very deep snow, you know, it's struggling a little bit, but uh, it helps it to be able to kind of pull its leg out backwards from the snow instead of kind of pushing forward and trying to, you know, get through the snow that way. If you're pulling your leg out from the back, then it's actually a much easier, a much more efficient way for them to move. So they're, you know, again, the thick snow, thick coats that they have and then um, long legs that they can kind of post hole through the deep snow. Uh, they're much more, uh, you know, able to, to handle that than, uh, than some other animals. That's not likely to find deer and moose in the same habitat. Right, no, not usually, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, I mean, they, they don't overlap much. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So they're, uh, they kind of specialize in different areas. Go ahead. Um, I think it was last year, um, there was a moose swimming in a lake on YouTube and some turkeys were in a, a motorboat and one fellow, they were drinking, one fellow jumped off and rode the moose and I guess everybody's looking for them to prosecute. Wow. Do you know how the moose ended up? Do you know if they got the I, That's the first I've heard of that story, huh? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I have a beat. And huh. that is, could you play the noise that the bears make? Um, you know, I don't think I, I have a recording of bears. Bears well, can growl and roar, kind of, but another um, kind of... Um, it's like a baby cry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's kind of another kind of, um, you know, lore of the Northeast is the, the hooting of a bear. Um, and again, they can't find any evidence that bears hoot. Um, it's more likely um, owls um, that are doing that. Yeah. Um, and you know, so sometimes uh, people might you know see a bear go by and then hear an owl hooting somewhere, but um, they've just never documented a single bear out of you know, thousands of different incidences of a bear hooting. So it's just, uh, and it's especially it seems to be kind of a, a Vermont thing. Uh, and you do hear it in other parts of New England too, but uh, for whatever reason, um, it's just uh, one of those legends that have you know gone through uh, for generations. And um, but they well, just you know no evidence to back it up at this point still. So. Um, all right, and uh, this is a couple other signs of uh, you know deer. When you see them, obviously, uh, most times you're seeing them running away from you. They're very skittish, uh, and when they're doing that, this one's bounding up this hill, so it looks almost like Bigfoot kind of ran up the hill here. But that's just all four legs landing in the spot. And that's about eight feet um, of a jump there. So they have you know extremely powerful legs, which everybody knows to you know tries to build fences to keep deer out of their, their gardens or uh, you know other places. They often and especially when the snow is deep, they often can just jump right over the top of a you know, five-foot fence or so. It's not that much of a problem for them. Usually seven to eight feet is kind of the minimum you want uh, when you have, a, you know, uh, trying to keep the deer out. Um, and this is a sign that you'll commonly see in, uh, with deer um, and moose, too, um, I suppose, uh, as well. Um, they're, not, they're large animals, and they like to uh, not always be on their feet so when possible. Um, this is uh, actually the outline of a deer laying down. Um, this is the arch of its back here. Here's its elbows here. Um, you know, its stomach, its front would be going this way, um, much like this. Um, so you can see, you know, it's kind of folded up its front feet there, um, and that's exactly what you see here. So you know, they, they hold a lot of body heat, but they still some does seep out, and they do actually melt out the snow a little bit. Um, but they don't, uh, you know, they're able to kind of keep a lot of that in. Um, so this is within a deer yard. Usually when you find one of those, you find many other ones kind of scattered all around. So in the winter, they like to kind of stay together in groups. Um, moose tend to be still more solitary during the winter. They don't really um, you know, kind of group up like the deer do. Um, and this is moose feeding sign. This is deer feeding sign. Um, that's uh, my walking stick, which is just over four feet tall. So, um, you know, you can see that uh, yeah, they're much... What's that? Reach top of rock bars, yeah. yeah, yeah, they can uh, they can reach up really high, uh, obviously. Um, and this uh, was a winter feeding sign. Now, they like to eat um, vegetation in the summer when they can, um, but in the winter, obviously, that's not available. And a lot of them are reduced to eating twigs and um, you know buds and, and bark, uh, even at that kind of cambium layer that's underneath. Um, and both moose and deer only have teeth on their bottom of their jaw. Uh, no teeth on the top of the jaw. What that means is when they're trying to get this uh, food, they dig their bottom teeth underneath and pull up, and then they have to tear off the bark. Um, so that leaves, uh, and it's the same thing with uh, when they bite off buds. Now when you see the sign of a rabbit or a hare eating, they have very sharp teeth in the top and bottom, so it almost looks like somebody got some shears and cut it off, and it's very sharp, clean, 45 degree angle. With deer and moose, it's always a little bit ragged on one end because there's no teeth on the top, so they just have to tear it off. 
So you can very clearly you know, see the difference between a you know, deer feeding sign and um, you know, other animals that would clip off a branch like that. Um, and this is uh, just to show kind of the typical um, prey species skull as compared to uh, some of those predator species skulls, um, mainly being that the eyes, uh, you know, they're not binocular really, they're kind of on the sides of the head because um, they need to be able to see, you know, almost behind them uh, to be able to see when something's approaching them so that they can, um, you know, kind of get away without being caught. Um, most pre predator species have eyes in the front of the head, the head because it's more important for them to have that binocular vision to be able to gauge distance and you know, very sharp focus and chase things down, whereas the prey species more often have their eyes on the side of the head um, because they need to be able to see better and uh, be able to try to get away. Um, and this is a moose feeding sign, too. It's a little hard to see here, but that's a ragged top. Often you find scat associated uh, with their feeding areas, too. Moose scat obviously would be quite a bit larger than uh, deer scat as well, uh, but they're both uh, pretty similar. Um, and this is uh, other common sign you'll see, uh, you know, during the other kind of time of year in the fall when their um, their antlers have kind of grown as pigs are going to get, and they're trying to um, one kind of rub off velvet, but also it's more important for them to um, kind of leave sign behind of uh, you know who they are, and you know, of course when they're rubbing this, there's glands here. There's actually glands all over deer. Um, they are full of uh, ways to be able to um, communicate to other deer. You know, it's rubbing its forehead, it's leaving signs there above the side of its face on, this, uh, on the tree. Um, every step it takes, it's leaving, again, signs behind because there's glands down there. Um, they'll often kind of urinate down their leg and that goes over these glands and that picks up more information. So when other deer are smelling that, they can understand the health of the animal. Um, again, it's just a whole different world uh, that we're kind of missing out on because uh, they can understand so many different things by all those different glands that are leaving different kinds of scent behind. So, and similar with the with those as well. Any other dying wishes uh, before the uh, end, end program ends? Oh, right. The beaver? Beaver. Help me out. Where is the beaver? Ah, there he is. All right, so beaver, uh, you know, again, an amazing animal. Um, a lot of fun to uh, watch them at work. Um, they are uh, very well adapted, obviously, to being underwater. They can be very fast when they're underwater. Um, and they can be very large. Uh, you know, a, a big beaver can be 60 pounds. Um, so they are, uh, you know, um, amazingly uh, big sometimes. Again, most times they're not quite that big, but still over 40 pounds on average. Um, so one of our larger rodents um, that we have over here. Um, and very efficient at changing their environment. Uh, you know, they change their environments uh, more than any other species besides humans. Um, and they make sounds, too, that are quite interesting. This is uh, young beavers. It's almost sound like human babies as well, too, um, when, they're, when they're communicating to each other. But uh, very strong, very sharp teeth, obviously, you know, to be able to bite into wood. Um, and very interesting looking feet. Um, their hind feet, of course, you know, webbed, uh, and that often shows up in the tracks. Uh, that's my track there, and that's their, one of theirs there. So big, uh, big hind feet, much smaller front feet. Um, and they uh, will often uh, feed on uh, bark as well, too. We don't know, especially during the fall, they're working on if they're lucky enough to build a, a, um, a den, uh, a lodge that they, under that lake uh, pond, they've stuck all sorts of branches in the mud underneath, and uh, being very cold water, the, those branches can last for months under underwater and still have kind of fresh food for them to go find. Um, and they have uh, these, you know, the hardware that they pack are, are pretty amazing too. Um, the reason it looks like they, you know, smoke too many cigarettes uh, is uh, because they have uh, actually, um, it's just enamel that's harder than the teeth on the other side. So when they're, you know, kind of uh, biting down, that, that wears at different rates. So what that means is it keeps a sharp edge on the front when this enamel is, and it's the softer teeth in the back wears faster, so it makes very, very sharp teeth. Um, and they have amazing lips, too, that actually close around their teeth, so they can actually use their teeth in underwater to you know, hold on to branches and other things without getting water in their mouth. Um, very highly adapted to that, too. Um, you know, very, very at home underwater. Um, and, yeah, just to make, you know, I don't know if you ever tried to bite into a tree, but it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do it no problem. They can go through 
you know, a tree of this thickness, uh, you know, in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, just you know, unbelievable um, to be able to do that just with your teeth. And of course, uh, this is another thing they're very well known for is building dams to create their habitat. They create their own habitat, you know, when they find it in the right spot. Um, and usually when you see, you know, dam upon dam upon dam, it's usually generations of, uh, you know, one family and then the young move on. And they, if they're not to go far, they won't. And they'll build the dam just upstream from, uh, you know, where they were before. And, um, you know, you see a lot of kind of generations of beavers uh, kind of, um, you know, take advantage of an area. Um, this is a... Uh, Beaver Dam site uh, in New Hampshire uh, with an active lodge there, an active uh, dam. You can tell it's active if uh, you know, usually you hear very little water um, kind of, kind of uh, you know, escaping from behind the dam. Kind of drives beaver, beavers crazy if they can hear that. And they, uh, they've done experiments where they actually, I think it's kind of mean, but they play recordings of trickling water and it just drives the beavers crazy. They go up and try to fix it and they can't figure out what's going on. And, uh, and so it does, whenever they hear that, it's just a natural reaction for them to, to want to be able to go try to find it. <laughs> um, right. Of course, uh, there we go. Um, and this is, uh, the, and, and also you can tell, you know, an active area usually because uh, the, the, the water level should be very high compared to the dam. Once it starts leaking, uh, that lodge starts to be shown and they're, they can be huge, this is an enormous lodge here. Most of it's underwater, you know, if this was uh, an active pond, it would probably still be, you know, right about here. And all you see is the top, so most of it's underwater. This is an example of uh, where they've stuck all those branches in the mud underneath and just the tops of them are sticking out of uh, the ice there. So this is, a, you know, an active uh, lodge here. Um, and sometimes you can also see if it's active, you can actually see beaver breath. Um, coming out on cold days because uh, the CO2 is still escapes on the top. They have their little, uh, they don't want to <laughs> suffocate inside their lodges, so they actually do have a vent on the top. Um, if there's a family of beavers in there, um, then you can actually see their breath coming out the top. Oh, it's pretty so amazing cool. thing to see on a you know, cold winter morning uh, near the beaver lodge. Cool. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, last one, last one. Real, 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 this is really the real deal, last one here. Um, coyotes, yeah, they are uh, just a very um, amazing animal as well, too. Um, and you'll see there's two things up here because um, they have been also kind of called the koi wolf uh, in the Northeast. And because it has been proven, it's been long suspected, uh, suspected but uh, it's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt in the past few years that uh, the coyotes of the Northeast are actually um, bred with wolves uh, and are a part wolf. Um, and the ones, uh, you know, and coyotes have only been in Vermont since the 1950s. Um, it really didn't become common in Vermont until the 70s, really. So they're a pretty new animal here. Um, and what they think what happened was, uh, you know, coyotes of the West kind of started pushing their way east um, just naturally, you know, kind of exploring new territories. And the ones that ended up uh, migrating over the top of the Great Lakes into Canada came across wolf species up there that were kind of uh, under stress. Usually, wolves and coyotes can't stand each other, don't want anything to do with each other. But both uh, these species were under stress at the time, and when they are that way, sometimes they actually will mate. Um, so they did mate with each other up in, uh, in Canada, and the ones that kind of came across up the top, they ended up coming, working their way down through New York State and coming down into Vermont and New Hampshire, and other ones came underneath too, uh, and those didn't mate with wolves, but now they've met together and they've started mating. What about the, and, uh, yeah. dogs? The yeah, they occasionally will mate with, uh, with dogs too, but the difference being, um, for whatever reason, whenever they mate with uh, domestic dogs, they tend to have their pups uh, in the middle of winter, um, and that's just, uh, those pups usually don't survive. Um, but uh, when they mate with wolves, um, it's kind of the natural cycle. They have their wolves still in the spring and everything, and um, they do have uh, you know, viable offspring, and they, and they continue on. Um, and they did a study that and scientists in Connecticut had something like 500 um, coyote um, pelts, uh, carcasses sent to them, and they did DNA on them, and found uh, some had as much as 80% wolf DNA. Um, but surprisingly, the percent of DNA had nothing to do with the size of the coyote. That one, eighty percent, was actually relatively small compared to some of the other ones. Um, but uh, there's just no doubt that they are definitely. And these are our coyotes are quite a bit larger than Western coyotes. If you ever spend Yellowstone or uh, seen other places, uh, California, they are you know, pretty small. They're a little bit bigger than the red fox you saw there. Whereas here, 
you know, it can be a 30 to 40 pounds you know, every once in a while, and a really big one will be uh, found as well too, 70 plus pounds. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, between 30 and 40. And they do look, you know, like a cross between a wolf and a western coyote. I mean, um, they're definitely uh, mixed together. Another thing that they share with their western cousins um, is, uh, you know, traits of both the wolf, and this is something you can hear here in Vermont, you know, commonly. Um, western coyotes don't really do as much of the kind of the long, drawn out stuff, and a lot more, more of the yipping stuff that we hear here, but there's kind of a mix of it in here. And again, Usually it's a family group, um, kind of letting other uh, coyotes in other parts of the area know that this is their territory. Um, and it's, it's often when you hear one of these off in the distance, you'll hear other coyotes entering them. And the difference uh, between uh, wolves and coyotes, however, is that for the most part, coyote packs are actually family units. They're uh, the dominant two, male and female for the area, and there are two or three offspring that they had. Uh, throughout the year, they don't really get together with you know, large groups and different, uh, you know, op different uh, um, wolves from from different mates. Usually, it's uh, you know just the, the kind of the dominant pair for that area. All the ones that pack up. There's a lot of uh, coyotes that are solitary that you'll see together, and that's usually you know a coyote that's a couple years old that hasn't uh, found a mate yet, um, and it's just not together. But you know, the, the packs that you see are family units for the most part. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go through this probably quickly because we've seen some of this before. But just uh, you know, domestic dog is the most common thing you'll confuse a coyote with. But um, often, you know, they have very blunt claws because they're walking on you know, pavement and hardwood floors. Whereas coyotes have extremely sharp claws because they're you know, obviously walking in the woods, and not doing a lot of uh, walking on roads and things like that. Um, this is just to show um, the difference between um, a flat-footed animal like humans and ones that are digit grade, uh, that you know, stand on their digits, the tip toes almost, uh, which allows them to uh, be much, uh, kind of spring into action a lot faster um, than animals that are flat-footed. And uh, these are, you know, looks like a very typical dog feet. Um, and then kind of the number one thing that helps you out when you're looking at dog tracks and coyotes especially, are they're very symmetrical. Um, you know, you can really draw an X, on uh, you know, nice clean tracks like this, a very clear X marks a spot um, right in the middle of them, uh, which uh, well, some domestic breeds you can too. I mean, you know, there's a million different kinds of domestic dogs that leave, you know, very convincing looking coyote tracks sometimes, but, um, you know, most breeds won't have quite as perfect as a, uh, you know, a track as we see like here for, for the wild coyotes. Um, and they um, have bigger front feet than hind feet, just like animals, uh, you know, carrying more weight up front. This is the uh, classic coyote, uh, canid trot, um, side trot. It's, uh, your dog does this too, uh, quite often. If you ever call your dog and it's trotting towards you, and you see it kind of kicks its rear end a little bit out as it comes up toward you, this is what it's doing. If you go look at its tracks, you'll see this, because, you know, they don't want, uh, when their hind foot's moving, if they just go walk straight, the hind foot's going to kind of smack into the back of the front foot. So if they kind of you know, go to the side a little bit, then that hind foot's going to be able to go off to the side, which is why you know, this, this is the front foot, this is the hind foot, it lands in front of where that front foot was. Um, and that's uh, you know, how they were able to do that, just kick their, their butts up to the side, kind of like this. So this is a fox, obviously, but fox will often use that uh, cane in trot as well, too. Um, and it's not always the case, but often, you know, the kind of the angle of where they uh, are pointed that way is the angle where their attention is, because uh, I guess if their butt's out to one side and their head is looking the other way, it kind of distributes the weight a little more clear, and oftentimes, um, you know, they're, when I see this, I kind of, kind of look where I am, often they're running along the side of the edge of the woods and they're looking towards the field uh, where they're running by just to see what's going on over there. Um, it's not always the case that that's why they're doing that, but you know, it is uh, often the case when they're kind of directing their attention to some certain area. Um, and they, uh, just like a fox, they will have uh, runs and, and um, gallops and trots as well too. They'll direct register, just like the fox, the, the red fox we saw there. This is a walk, um, overstep walk, front foot here, hind foot here, front hind, front hind. So they're a little bit more apt to walk um, than the, uh, the, the red foxes sometimes. This is a domestic dog walk, just to show you the difference. A um, little bit more, and I guess sloppy is a term that I use. It just seems like wild animals are more efficient at everything that they do, including just walking. Uh, and this is just kind of a little bit more of a meander um, than you see. Even like, you know, this coyote had a destination in mind that was headed there. And your dog's kind of like, oh, whatever. I don't know. Kind of walk around. And this one is probably on leash, so he's probably offset anyway. You know, um, he doesn't want to be on a leash. Uh, but uh, it's a little, little bit different. 
Um, and this is uh, that transverse gallop that we saw in the fox. And just uh, to show you, um, the, there's always, oftentimes there's two feet down at the same time, a hind and a front. And when you see that, you can get some idea of the size of the animal um, because that kind of is the size of their, their body usually. If you kind of draw a line straight up, so, you know, when I stand right over the top of these tracks, I can kind of get the idea of the size of the animal. When they're trying to maybe decide whether it's a coyote or a fox sometimes, um, you know, the fox is going to be, you know, quite a bit smaller than the, the size of the coyote body. So, it's, a, it, you know, it's not a foolproof method, but it's definitely something, that, again, that can kind of help you sometimes determine how big of an animal you're looking at when you look out, you know, the next front and hind foot, because this is kind of what, you know, that was how the animal made that. Um, and this is what you'll see too as well, um, usually on the top of a hill somewhere. Um, and usually if there's a you know, group of them together, there's more than one. And that is where um, coyotes spent the evening. Um, sometimes they don't even need shelter at all. They'll just, um, you know, they usually like to be up on a little bit of a raised surface somewhere just because you know, they're just kind of up higher so the scents come to them a little bit faster if they need to you know, kind of move on very quickly. Um, but uh, you know, oftentimes, again, just like the deer, when you find one of these, look around and you know, sometimes you'll find more and you'll find uh, hair in there oftentimes too, they're kind of stuck in the snow too, um, that I have there. Uh, this was a den of a, a, red, uh, of a coyote as well. Um, kind of, that is, yeah, that's his ear right there, it's so hard to see and it's dark here and there. But, so it was, uh, spent uh, just a few hours there. I had the camera there, I saw that it uh, went in there about 9 o'clock at night. This is midnight, just 12.30 almost. Um, when it came out, my camera only goes to zero degrees. Um, doesn't go below zero, so this was, I think, uh, you know, 20 below that night or something like that. It was um, pretty amazing, but um, just you know, got right up and ran away there. So um, yeah, and uh, just yeah, coyotes will when they're rare animals are big enough to take down deer. So this is a kill site. Obviously, I'll get too graphic on you there, but um, that is uh, something you'll come across occasionally. Um, they can go. This carcass was here. One night went back, there's nothing left the next day. Um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how fast they can go through um, you know, an animal like that, especially if there's you know, four or five coyotes. So, um, yeah, I'm about to talk more, but uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, <laughs>